the house. Give it up for the geezers. Had a golden years, all planned out. Small pension golf cart and a Florida house. But Congress put a hit on Social Security. Mugged us of our dignity despite our maturity. Tax we paid, every check we earned. Time to collect, we the ones getting burned. There's nothing we can do if we can't get paid. Except eat, have food, and drink Gatorade. Listen up, cuz, while we drop some knowledge. We raise our little boy, put him through college. Only safety net is our next of kin. Look out, son, cuz we're moving in. What? We're moving in. What? We're moving in. What? Pull out the couch cause we're moving in. No arguing. No arguing. Pull out the couch cause we're moving in. Name's Spinal Twist, check my orthopedic kicks. Cause I stoop farther south than the St. Lunatics. I'm still getting play and it's all thanks to Pfizer. Keeping me stiffer than my Yankees cap visor. My station wagon windows are dark with tint. I subscribe to Vibe and I get the large print. They call me Martini, got substance abuse. Cause I'm always playing gin and sipping on juice. Our son wants to know if we can pay the rent But without benefits, we ain't got 50 cents We don't pack a nine, we're just strapped for funds But we're still game killers for our bachelor son You're out of town Social security payments are far from erratic It's broken, broken failing, failing, don't believe that static This crisis is a fiction, there would be no debate If we all pitched in at the same tax rate There's a cap on how much millionaires pay Even though we all work like every single day These are the facts, but they're proven thin So pull out the couch, cause we're moving in what? We're moving in what? We're moving in what? Pull what? out the couch, cause we're moving, moving in, in. No arguing what? No arguing what? Pull out the couch cause we're moving in Alright now young and you're our last resort Cause sooner or later we'll be needing support If you don't want roommates just learn this rap It's only one line shout Scrap the cap Scrap the cap Scrap the cap Throw your hands up just scrap the cap Scrap the cap Scrap the cap Throw your hands up just scrap the cap Scrap the cap Grab the cap. I love that video. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to our Revolution Washington. Thanks for tuning in to our town hall series tonight called Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Oh, we have our host, uh, myself, Rhonda Walker. And of course, we've got Amber King. And we have a new addition, Shanda Masta is here tonight. So thank you guys for joining me um, in tonight's show. We have a special guest with us. Sarah Jaffe is with us tonight. She's an author um, of a new book that uh, came out. Um, so I'm having some glitches, I apologize. Uh, and then we also have... Um, our journalist and author of Necessary Trouble is her, her book that she just came out with that is uh, on pre-order, I believe. And then next up, we'll be talking to Jeff Johnson. Uh, he's a former president of the Washington State Labor Council, um, and he's got some good news with his new positions he's at. I'll let uh, him explain that a little bit further. So thank you both for being here as well. Uh, we are organizing a political revolution to challenge the power of the plutocrats and prioritize the needs of people and our planet. With your support, we are building a national grassroots movement of local groups powerful enough to win progressive issue fights, elect progressive champions, transform our political system, and get big money out of politics. With our revolution, we do believe in good jobs for all. The gap between rich and poor is now the widest it's ever been in 50 years. As wages continue to static, working people across America are suffering. Unions are the best antidote we have to income inequality. When 
workers join unions and use their collective strength to negotiate better wages, all workers benefit. Yet union members today is at its lowest level in history with more than 7% decline since Trump took office. That's why we're organizing to expand the right of workers to form unions, pass a 15 federal minimum wage, and end so-called right to work legislation. We're also fighting to ensure that our taxpayer dollars are invested in companies that create good union jobs in the USA, not firms that steal wages and ship jobs overseas. It is May Day, the day after. There's a lot that happened this weekend. So just a little quick synopsis. In, in 1889, an international federation of socialist groups and trade unions designated May 1st as a day in support of workers. In commemoration of the Hay Haymarket riot in Chicago in 1886, five years later, U.S. President uh, Glover Cleveland, uneasy with the socialist origin of Workers' Day, signed legislation to make Labor Day already held in some states on the first Monday of September. The official U.S. holiday in honor of the workers, Canada followed suit not long after. Quick little synopsis of some of the May Day, but Amber, uh, I would love for you to um, take us into our first interview. I'm really looking forward to what she's going to bring to the table and let us uh, in on everything that happened this weekend. Amber, you ready to take it away? Amber, you're muted. Oh, Amber, you need to unmute. Oh, well, that would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Hi. About that. There's Amber. Yeah, no worries. Um, I was just saying thank you so much to Sarah for joining us from the East Coast. We know it's late there. So shout out. I know you've had a busy week and a few days with it being May Day. Um, you were one of the keynote speakers on the Labor Notes. That's actually how I got introduced to you with the Labor Notes organization. And um, some of the trainings that they've had have been amazing. Check out the link in our rundown. Um, how are you doing tonight? What's uh, What's been happening for you on May Day? My goodness, I'm recovering from yesterday. You know, I'm used to being out in the streets following whatever's going on. And, and instead, I was sort of in like command center behind my computer screen trying to figure out what was going on everywhere. It's a little harder to keep up with right now when everything's, you know, things are happening virtually, you're, you're sort of not sure if the thing you've heard about is really happening. I mean, it's, it's a lot. Uh, so I was mostly trying to keep up with everything that was going on. There were strikes across the country from gig workers, um, Amazon workers, Walmart workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, immigrant worker caravans around the country. I mean, so much interesting work is being done trying to figure out how to make protests sort of still striking and still um, effective when we're all trying to stay away from each other as much as possible. Yeah, it's definitely been interesting having this, uh, you know, socially or spatially distance, we like mm -hmm. to say, and trying to, to close that socially distance cap, um, which has actually for me, um, having being one of those workers um, and former several unions, but mm -hmm. also having to constantly work multiple jobs and raise children, that um, I have more time to be able to connect with a lot of people and a lot of organizations that I've only been able to follow. So for, for me, it's been great, um, you know, having you know, been able to put on these town hall events and, and connect with everything that's going on. I was downtown in Seattle yesterday um, in front of the Bezos balls and going on to, um, to one of our larger, um, one of the largest uh, housing um, owners in the Seattle area. So we delivered a, a rent strike letter to him requesting assistance, but it's, it's been really interesting, you know, especially having been part of previous May days, um, in Seattle, it's, you know, and starting back from WTO days, it's, um, we have a very militarized police here. 
um, it's it's very intimidating, and um, we've had some some awful violent clashes in the last few years. So yesterday seemed super tame and peaceful, and we were hanging out in our cars, making noise, and um, still were able to get our point across. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was great. So I, I will talk a little bit more about that later, but. Um, yeah, I, I just love some of the work you've done. You just have such an amazing angle um, that you bring to stories and and are able to really frame things, I think, from a viewpoint that I understand being, you know, on maybe on the younger side of labor and female, having worked on um, everything from uh, TSA lines to commercial fishing boats. I've, I've seen a lot. I've worked 15, 20 years in the culinary industry as well, and now I work in construction. So... Um, I've I've seen a lot of things and 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 I just love your viewpoints. You also seem to take a really great global approach and and have a lot of history. What what are some of the takeaways that that you had after yesterday? I you know I'm both impressed by how much people are able to pull off and also sort of struck by how much further we need to go. Like there's a lot of talk about like sort of May Day general strike and I don't think it does us a lot of good to try to declare that something happened that didn't happen because the boss, I promise you, knows exactly how much power you actually have when you exercise it. Um, but it is nevertheless striking to me how many people I've talked to from around the country who are working in all of these, you know, quote unquote, essential jobs that were, they were always essential jobs, but now we're just calling them that. But the, the whole shift in how we talk about that work, where we're suddenly acknowledging that grocery store work is essential work, that delivery driver work is essential work, that warehouse work is essential work. It does feed into how people are feeling about their work. And they're saying, you know, okay, you're saying we're essential. You aren't treating us like we're essential. And if you're not going to treat us like we're essential, and that means protective equipment, that means decent pay, that means sick time, that means access to healthcare, then we're not going to keep showing up to work like good little workers anymore. So it's a really interesting time to be a labor reporter. I keep joking that sort of everybody's a labor reporter now, but there is a difference in those of us who have actually been following this for a long time. Seeing what's changing in real time is, is really, it's fascinating. It's also, you know, everything is horrifying. So I don't want to be like, oh, yeah, it's great. It's a really terrible time, too. And it's scary for a lot of these people who are still going to work, you know, in customer facing jobs. And you have to just trust that your customers are going to actually treat you well and not, you know, cough coronavirus on you. Yeah, I mean, I one of my first jobs was in a grocery store, so I I definitely know the <laughs> the hazards that can come along with it. Mm -hmm. It's it's been interesting to see, you know, see, especially I guess to me, there's such a an air of surveillance um, with this pandemic at the moment, yeah. um, that that's super concerning as far as workers' rights and individual rights. And, and, you know, we see Amazon using that against their workers, using it, you know, technology and mm -hmm. um, social media. Um, it's, it's really made organizing, I think, a different, a different type, you know, and so it's, it's caused a lot of, you know, we saw that with them. Um, actually with the Amazon workers trying to talk about the environment and all of a sudden now they have an NDA, they can't, can't yeah. speak upon it. Um, but it's, you know, it's actions like that, that we see that keep happening or, you know, younger employees or people that just haven't really ever been empowered in their lives, but, you know, put into these gig economies and, you know, just don't know the ropes, I guess, as well as say like my grandparents who, you know, almost everybody had at least one union job in the household. So it's a really different dynamic. Yeah, I mean, we're in a moment where a lot of, for a lot of people, we're at, at something like six percent public mm -hmm. or private sector union density, right? That means there's a very small number of people who've actually experienced a union job, and we've seen some growth on that front, right? Like the only thing that's kept the labor movement from just like falling off a cliff in the last few years has been young people unionizing in a variety of workplaces from Starbucks to my industry in journalism. But now, you know, we're, we're in this place where you've got 30 million people applied for unemployment in the last few weeks or last month and a half. Um, that's, that's bonkers, right? That's what one in every, you know, however many workers, I'm not good at math, but like, so we're talking about a third of the workforce laid off. 
that should be a moment where labor has very little power. But at the same time, like the people who are still necessary, the people who are still going to work now in these jobs that again are, are now deemed essential. Um, nobody's going to rush in to take those jobs, right? When you might get a side of coronavirus along with the French fries that you're serving at McDonald's or at the warehouse job, right? So the people who have been in those jobs actually do have a level of power that again is being amplified by the fact that we are all calling them essential workers. You know, when I drive through Philadelphia to go to the grocery store, there's billboards up saying, thank you, essential workers. And it's not just healthcare workers, it's also saying grocery store workers, right? So I think we have to think really hard about this moment and the things that like people are being asked to risk by going to work every day and how we support that and their the actions that they want to take to challenge the conditions they're being put in. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Shanda, what are what are your thoughts on all of this uh, from, from the pieces you've seen? Yeah, I am I on? Okay, so I've got so many questions. You know, I have always been, like you said, only 6% have experienced a union. In, in my life, I've always worked those jobs that are unionless and you better not talk union or they'll just fire you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the, in light of these NDAs that we're seeing, say like Amazon make workers sign, mm -hmm. what's to just not have every employee put one of those out and our people can never unionize. And what is the number one thing somebody who is just a grocery store clerk who is not unionized because, you know, I was a clerk for 20 years, but I worked at gas stations. So I didn't get that type of representation. What's the number one thing they can do? The number one thing that people should know is you don't have to be in a union to have your collective activity on the job protected by law. So you can still go on strike with your coworkers if you do not have a union. You can still organize and make demands on your boss with your coworkers if you do not have a union and that is legally protected. Now, granted, the National Labor Relations Board hasn't been really that functional for quite a while and has only gotten worse under Trump and has only gotten worse under Trump and coronavirus. But that said, you don't need a union in order to act with your coworkers to try to improve your job. And that's what we're seeing right now, right? A lot of the strikes that we've seen in the last few, the last month or so um, have been led by non-union workers. We're talking about Amazon warehouse workers, Whole Foods workers. Um, again, I mean, there are a lot of grocery store workers in this country who are still unionized, but the majority of them still are not. And yet people are, are taking action in those spaces. So I think it's really important to remind people that like, you don't have to be a member of a union in order to, um, I, I like to call it the Newsies rule. If you know the, the movie and musical Newsies, um, the line where he says, uh, well, if we strike, then we're a union. <laughs> it's not wrong. <laughs> if you act collectively with your coworkers, you are acting like a union. And so that's what we saw with like the red for red strikes in the last few years. In a lot of cases, you're dealing with non-union workers or workers whose unions don't have collective bargaining rights, but who still manage to act like a union and wielded a tremendous amount of power. Absolutely. I agree so much. And um, I, I personally think that all of these essential workers that are being deemed essential now, the fight needs to begin today now that they get the pay and the coverages that they deserve because they've been deemed essential. Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about trying to reopen the economy right now, or we don't have a cure for the virus, we don't have a vaccine for the virus. So that means like, you know, when, when elected officials are acting like the peak is like a thing that just happens. And then after that, we're through it. It's bonkers, right? Like the peak is because of how many people got infected and the lockdown is a thing that that subdued that. So if they're trying to talk about reopening right now without giving everybody in a job that is facing customers proper protective gear, that's, that's just going to result in another wave of the, DC, the virus, right? So we need to really be thinking as people are turning to this, you know, argument that we need to reopen to save, save the economy. The economy is just people, right? Like we, it's not like a monster that we have to feed or else it's going to eat us all. Like it's just how we organize society. And currently we do that around markets and maybe we could do that a different way. But 
to talk about reopening right now without giving all of these workers proper protective gear, sick time, the right to go home if they're not feeling well. I mean, I, it, that's not even nearly enough considering this disease can be, you know, asymptomatic for weeks or forever and still be spread. But I'm learning so much because I keep talking to nurses. That's amazing. <laughs> and I mean, we're still in a position where I'm talking to nurses who don't have enough protective gear, right? Let alone like enough protective gear to give every clerk at the grocery store an N95 mask. Like nurses don't have enough N95 masks still, right? Doctors don't have enough N95 masks. Like we're still in a position where healthcare workers are demonstrating daily, weekly to demand more protective gear. Like we are just not anywhere close to being able to actually reopen without making sure that we protect everyone. Well, and we're also seeing like states starting to, you know, hoard and divert shipments because the feds were coming in and taking their PPE orders. So, I mean, it's just bonkers, right? such a broken it's system. Bonkers. It's just completely like literally like when you're reading articles in medical journals, right? I read what was it the New England Journal of Medicine, I think the other day where, you know, this, this hospital administrator, like not a burning radical, like hospital administrators are not exactly like our people, um, was writing about like, oh, we had secured a delivery of these N95 masks and we get to the plane to pick them up. And like, there's federal whatever is trying to take them from us. It's just like, what the hell is even going on here? And, and I mean, that's, that's, that part is like the dramatic and fascinating and like weirdly fascinating part, but the sort of less dramatic, more boring day-to-day -day operation of capitalism, part of it is that we have this entire supply chain for like everything we rely on that's built on, on just-in-time delivery, which you would think if it's all built on just-in-time that we would be able to turn it around really quick and make the things we need, except it turns out that that's not what just-in-time means at all. What just in time means is just like they don't want to have it in a warehouse for any downtime at all. They don't want to have any slack in the system. You don't want to have any sort of equipment stockpiled anywhere that might not get used. And so we're seeing the results of that kind of system right now because we don't have enough supplies when demand goes up for healthcare, right? And we we already have a healthcare system that doesn't that isn't designed to treat every person, right? We have a healthcare system that's designed to treat most people who have some sort of insurance, not a healthcare system that's designed to be able to treat everybody who gets sick. Yeah. And again, we're seeing in real time the results of all of these systems and how they're not set up to serve people, they're set up to serve profits. And everybody needs a new washer and dryer every six months and a new car every three years. And, and we shipped all those jobs overseas. So that's a piece of it you know i'm i'm curious especially coming from um you know the culinary industry and looking at agriculture as mm -hmm. well as heavy machinery and pieces that are solely almost made overseas mm -hmm. um you know do you think this will bring back some of those manufacturing jobs in a in a better way to the us or are we gonna is it just one too expensive things, one of the things i've been thinking about when we're talking about these states that are saying they're going to reopen we're talking about Georgia, we're talking about South Carolina. I mean, you're in Washington state, right? You know that like outsourcing isn't just to other countries, it's also to non-union regions of the US, right? Because Boeing packed up and went down to Nikki Haley, South Carolina, where Nikki Haley talked about kicking the unions out with her high-heeled shoes on, right? Um, and so when you look at, at, you know, Kemp in Georgia saying we're gonna reopen, like one of the signals they're sending once again is we are willing to risk working people's lives in this state in order to protect your profits. And they're gonna send that message to companies that are in states where the governor has actually maybe acted like human life had value and hope that they get more of those companies shipping inside the US. So like, it's not just a problem of, of going outside of the borders. It's also, we have a massive problem with just like moving jobs around the US, right? And moving away from where you might have some labor protections, where you might have some, you know, leverage and, and yeah. And so 
to think about supply chains and how we're going to have to make them sustainable is a huge question that I'm sure you don't have time for tonight, but it's it's one that we need to be thinking about in the upcoming time of climate change that coronavirus is maybe accelerating how we think about, um, that we need to think about it in terms of sustainability for all sorts of reasons, not just to protect jobs, but to protect, again, life, right? Like how do we actually make sure our economy is built around keeping people alive, not just keeping people in money. And or, or enslaved <laughs> in debt. <laughs> Um, right. And, and, you know, again, when we we're talking about these these states saying they're going to reopen, one of the things that happens if they are now, if companies are not legally mandated to be shut down anymore, is they can kick workers off unemployment insurance, you can kick small businesses off of small business um, funding streams, you can say, oh, you should be reopened now, you shouldn't have any problems anymore, right? You should be doing great. And that's going to make people have to make the choices on their own now, right? Without any protections, without any support, and you're going to force people into some really awful choices. And so this is a time where we need to be thinking about not like, oh my God, those people in Georgia are our competition for jobs, but those people in Georgia are being asked to risk their life for jobs because our governor is maybe not quite as willing to put our lives on the line for those jobs. Yeah, I mean, we've we've seen a lot of the ICE actions, too, for people who, who don't have legal status, and that's just yeah. been horrific and affecting um, our supply chain. And I always like to think, especially in terms of food and and everything, that we just need to shorten them. And, and hopefully there'll be a new wave of cooperative restaurants opening and cooperative employee-owned small businesses and that people will learn to organize in that fashion going forward because it's taken out so many small businesses. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know you have this awesome book. It is on pre-order. How? What else can you tell us about your book and where to find it and where else can people find you? So you have Necessary Trouble on the screen. That book is out there. You can buy it. There is a chapter about Seattle and Shama Sawant in it. Um, and the new book is called Work Won't Love You Back. And we literally just like launched a pre-order page for it this week, which is why nobody has information about it yet. Um, but it is about, well, how work won't love you back. It's about this expectation that we will all love our jobs and get all our fulfillment from going to work and how bosses use that to wring more work out of us for less money and in crappier conditions. That is awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank Are there you. any questions out there? Thank you everybody on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Periscope. My thinking, where else are we at? We're, we're streaming all over the web, interwebs tonight. Are there any questions for Sarah that anybody sees, Oz or anybody else? I was looking on, on uh, YouTube. I'm not sure if um, Franklin's sending anything to Oz right now, but there wasn't anything majorly as far as questions asked uh, and there's more of just responses responding to uh, what was being said, and you are definitely loved, Sarah. Um, I asked if anybody had any questions for you, and human said, just ask her to come back. <laughs> oh, I'd love to. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so they seem to be pretty happy, but um, nothing that's like, like a major question. I think they're just excited about getting a hold of your book. Yeah. And I, you know, I think just the whole, the whole conversation, like we just haven't had enough conversations with labor in the forefront, especially in this election cycle. Like we talk a lot about supporting unions and labor, but we really haven't been able to, to really dive deep into the, what that means. And so thank you so much again for helping open our eyes and entertain our audiences. And I know I'll be looking forward to your book and we'll make sure to have the new book link uh, up in our rundown as well. Thank you. It was great to have you. Thank you again so much, Sarah. It was such a pleasure having you on. And yes, we hopefully will talk with you again very soon. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in uh, and listening to the wonderful Sarah. Um, up next, Amber and uh, Shanda are going to be uh, talking with Jeff. Um, Amber. Go ahead and take this next piece away. All right, awesome. So joining us tonight as well, we are honored to have Jeff Johnson, 
from uh, the islands up north of Puget Sound. He is our former president of the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. He is also on the board for Labor for Sustainability, as well as PARSA, which is the Puget Sound, let me see, Puget Sound Advocates for Retirement Action, which is where you saw our awesome opening video of our geezers and grannies. Give it a big shout out to the Raging Grannies for me. They've come and helped me with lots of actions over the years. And uh, I hadn't, I realized I hadn't seen that video in a few years. So did that, did that bring back some funny memories for you, Jeff? It did. It was a great video. And, uh, you know, Puget Sound Advocates for Retirement Action, they were all, act, all the actors in the uh, film were Pissarra members. <laughs> That's even better. That's great. I know my, uh, my grandparents were, uh, my grandma was a Rosie back up at Boeing in the, during the war. And then they uh, both on and off worked at Dairy Gold for many, many years. So happy union family as well. But uh, yeah, so you have been, you've kind of moved on. Um, tell us a little bit about your time when you were on the State Labor Council and, and what things were like and what you've seen change since then. Well, let me, let me say this. I, uh, I was with the State Labor Council for 32 years. Okay, so uh, I've, uh, I've seen a lot of changes over time. Um, what I, uh, I think liked the, the best about uh, being part of the council is that uh, we have a, a relatively progressive labor movement in the state of Washington. Uh, and I should say a relatively progressive union movement, but then it's a movement that looks towards the wider labor movement, including immigrant workers, communities of color, the tribe, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, the uh, you know bringing together of labor and community as one voice is uh, is something that uh, we do pretty well in the state. Um, you know, I. Uh, I want to. I want to say this. You had asked uh, uh, Sarah this question to, to lead off, and I, and I want to take a shot at it myself. Uh, you know, in this time of economic chaos that we're facing, this time of existential crises, the thing that uh, is, uh, uh, I think, most uh, um, uh, important to me is I see an awakening of the working class out there, and it's it's at first it's, it's showing itself up as compassion for for work that workers have for each other. Um, and it's taking the form of real cross-sectoral solidarity. There's a moment of recognizing that we have a greater labor movement. I mean, this whole term of essential workers, I heard this Amazon warehouse worker the other day um, say, okay, so they're calling me an essential worker, right? And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see... I don't see the value of that other than it's it's a pretty name, but what I'm really concerned about is once the pandemic's over, am I still gonna be essential? And uh, you know, whether you're talking about farm workers, grocery workers, healthcare workers, truck drivers, uh, first responders, warehouse workers, you know, all of them are essential workers and all of them are starting to ask the question, how is our economy and society gonna be organized differently? Wow. Thank you so much, Jeff. We are so sorry to everybody. We crashed the studio. First time in history. guess the topic's too hot, but we are definitely going to have Jeff back with us. He is amazing. Sarah has been amazing tonight. And we're going to just keep the show rolling. So that actually leads us right into a little clip I found about my friend Jeff Bezos. Hit it, Oz. A union, but we are not neutral either. While we understand unions work in some industries, they would conflict with our culture, customer obsession, and direct working relationship. Throughout Amazon's 25-year history, there have been multiple rumblings of workers trying to unionize. The people united will never be defeated. But none of those efforts have been successful. Amazon remains non-union, in part by training its managers how to handle union efforts, like in this video, which was sent to Whole Foods managers in 2018. We do not believe unions are in the best interest of our customers, our shareholders, or most importantly, our associates. Efforts by big businesses to fend off organized labor are increasingly common in America, while union membership has dropped considerably since its heyday 50 years ago. But with record-breaking sales numbers and newly doubled shipping speeds, momentum to organize has picked up among some of Amazon's more than 650,000 worldwide employees. We work, we sweat, 
Amazon workers need a rest. Three big unions that are talking to Amazon workers are the Teamsters, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, and the Retail, Wholesale, and Department Store Union, among others. Last year, the CEO of Axel Springer asked Jeff Bezos his stance on unions. We don't believe that we need a union to be an intermediary between us and our employees. Um, but of course... <laughs> so terrible. Of course, of course we don't need a union to be an intermediary. What are some of the reasons? Guys, talk to me here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Ladies. We don't need nobody fighting for you guys. We've got enough lawyers in our pocket to do that for you. Yes. I, I personally want to give a shout out to my friends that I know lost their jobs, quit over the bullshit when uh, Whole Foods was taken over. It, it's it been awful. It's been awful for a long time. Jesus. Shanda, words? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we got dueling live streams going. I, I'm sure there's other households dealing with this too. So what an amazing conversation that we had tonight. These people are so incredible. You know, as a progressive organizer, I've always wanted to figure out how I get involved and we and I help the labor movement. And it was an incredible conversation. Yeah, you know, Jeff, when he says it is especially damning to our uh, associates, Please. Yeah, we've seen the kind of care he's provided so far, and it's appalling. It's I don't. What did they say? Like three three people now have died at Amazon factories Five. and plants. Five. Five. Yeah, it's it's insane. It's insane. They're you know, what for two bucks an hour? Yeah, essential right? essential package handlers. That is a back breaking, awful job. Awful job. I mean, it's it's insane. I mean, there are worse, but it's not for for that kind of pay for the terrible benefits. And and I do insurance billing. I know what kind of benefits Amazon gives you in your tiered system, and it's a lot of money. I've had so many people come in for services that were from other countries because they entire you know entice a lot of overseas workers, um, burn the crap out of them after their two year stint and leave them completely broken, unable to get healthcare because it's so expensive and, and, you know, ship them off back home. You know, yep. it's, it's insane. It's insane to me. Um, and if so we're going to coin this, you know, essential worker, it's time that if, if you're a, an essential worker now and in a month, you need to be getting paid to be that essential worker. That name should carry on with them. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. So what else have you guys seen um, on May Day? Obviously, it was yesterday. I was downtown at uh, the Bezos Balls affectionately named here in downtown Seattle. The Bezos and, Balls? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Biosphere would be the, oh, the appropriate Biosphere. Term. Okay, thank you. But they are known as Bezos Balls Bezos because Ball? they're two giant balls in the middle of his complex that he's built. Um, and so, you know, essentially we were protesting, obviously, that uh, they pay no taxes. And, um, you know, the the strife that that causes the city um, for the insane amount of wealth that he brings in every day, literally, to his own pocket is insane. So I did take a little bit of video. We were all socially distanced, unlike some of the other protests happening yesterday. Um, you know, for ha for myself, having been involved in a lot of May Days, like I said earlier, it was pretty mild. You know, it, it brought the kids and the dog and we were, you know, we had a good time. We were blasting music and uh, everybody had our masks on and our signs up and there's people on motorcycles, bicycles. Um, we blocked the traffic. The police were actually not awful to us for the first time in many, many years. So yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of interesting and especially seeing some of the, the right wing protests that have been happening about the shutdown and how they're reacting to police presence. And, you know, as somebody who was at WTO here in Seattle, like, I can, I kind of just chuckle a little, you know, it's, it might be their turn to realize what our militarized police zone has, has become. And, you know, we know how to get permits now, and we've, we've done the paperwork to, to know what to expect and how to stay safe in a crowd and, and be, uh, you know, be effective at what we're trying to do. So what, what are you said of that? Yeah, I do. But I was curious, what, what else have you guys seen? You know, there's articles all over. I know um, 
one of the cool pictures, I don't know if Oz can pull it full screen in this. Um, I was on one of the calls and the, the well, mom is ready for the videos ready to go right now before pulling in another <laughs> picture real quick. I think he's just ready because you were talking about being there. So if, is it okay if we show that right now and then go to the <laughs> picture? Yeah, it's, a, it's actually the picture above our heads. Um, <laughs> but I was, I was just going to say one of those has to do with the um, part of what we were protesting yesterday was also the rent strike. And so um, that sign on that lady's car is the the moms the moms for um, moms for housing group, which is awesome. If you haven't checked it out, momsforhousing.org, and that was down at the port in Oakland, California. So obviously, this is of course impacting um, you know people's ability to pay rent, pay mortgages, and most importantly, impacting women and children and minorities, people of color those without legal status. And we are most concerned about their abilities to stay safe and stay housed and care for their families. So anyway, if you want to roll the video, we can That is a really about. cool picture. Sorry, I didn't know that was already up there. I was like, I just saw him just trying to put that up. But that picture is pretty freaking awesome looking. Yeah, they're an amazing group. So it's, uh, it's it's pretty amazing. I know all of us are involved in a lot of different things, but yeah, if you want to play a little video and we can chat about what else we've we've seen um, from this May Day. <laughs> we were really loud. I had to give my daughter earplugs. <laughs> People of all ages, that's what's really cool. We even brought the dog today. She's decked out in our revolution gear. Representing finally and behaving herself, considering all the noise. Hope everybody is supporting in solidarity and not making purchases from Amazon today, along with the other box stores. Supporting our healthcare workers and our essential workers. Ooh. Hey! Yeah, play the song! Oh my gosh, I gotta get this. Uh, woo! Play us a song! So that that was pretty much it. That was that was the scene. We we were at the Bezos Balls for about an hour, and then we um went up to the ask happening there. The well, the ask was to tax tax Amazon. They pay zero city taxes, zero state taxes. Washington, for those of you listening, has the most regressive tax system in the country. So those of us at the very bottom pay the most, and those at the very top pay the least. And uh, it has to change. It absolutely has to change. It's insane. And then we were asking for uh, stay on rent, of course, that um, we went to one of the largest owners of, of not commercial, but non-commercial um, properties in the city and asked for a, a rent stay from his, I think, over 5,000 properties. So we did a little parade, it was a couple miles, and then we um, blocked the streets there, and we were jamming out to music, and Shama Sawant was there with, um, you know, all of our awesome activists, Extinction Rebellion, a lot of our, a lot of, lot of my familiar faces that I see in uh, many actions for the last 20 years in Seattle. What else did you guys see around, uh, around the interwebs and around the country? Well, you know, we got this really great uh, group on Facebook right now oh, and Twitter called Corona Strike. And um, it's founded by members that have been in the movement for years. It's basically just one central location where we can go and find out what's going on in your neck of the woods, you know. And so you can find it at coronastrike.us is their website, or you can check them out on Facebook or Twitter. You know, you scroll through there, there's great activists posting what they're doing locally, what they're doing regionally. That's a great resource. Awesome. Oh, I've seen just lots of stuff everywhere. Um, I just, uh, it was hard to tune into all of it, but we shared some things out. Um, I was, you know, working on getting ready for today, so I didn't join in a lot uh, personally, but I saw a ton. 
Yeah, I feel the same way. I just watched from home. I was, Amber, I was so jealous <laughs> watching you guys out there. I'm like, oh, I want to be out there so bad. <laughs> yeah, no, it was good. And I, and, you know, we have some other actions planned. So I want, I really wanted to see how that went. Um, I do know that some, that they were, um, caravanning all the way to Olympia. Uh, there was a lot of protests down there as well in a same, same car protest style. Um, How do you think, think that's working out? The car protest style I, from home, it looks like it's effective, maybe even more effective than when we're just on the ground. It is. It is. I mean, I don't like the fossil fuel resources being spent right. for it, but we're able to physically cover enough ground and, and be effective and safe and spatially distanced. Sure. Um, but still be with each other in camaraderie and solidarity, which to me is awesome. Yeah. And, and you get to make so much more noise, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't, I was saying. Wow, I've had you like got your radio, you can blast a bullhorn out the window. I was like, well, we could be really loud this way. Yeah. We, it's way louder. Um, I like the you idea, know? but I'm still a little bit hesitant just because, you know, it still puts a possible, you know, something happening a liability in the way if somebody's car breaks down, if, you know, I mean, it just, I mean, there still is the idea and, and all of that. And, and if it's working, that's great. But I still, if you really want to think about it, I mean, I don't know. I, I I'm iffy. I'm, I'm torn between uh, going out and doing that and just trying to be as safe as possible and, you know, buckle down. So well, we actually like, like the down aspect of the group, but our group is, is out there. <laughs> We, I mean, to me, it was super fun having done this a lot with like the, the Franken food cars during the 5222 battles um, and the other food labeling initiatives. It's, it's a really fun way to get a lot of excitement built. Um, we actually saw somebody, some guy fell on his bicycle and like three cars pulled over and were like helping him. Like he was totally like stunned. And so we were out there providing aid, you know, and the cops are just like cruising on by, you know, so it's like, I, I feel honestly like it, it's, it's a better show of support and people came out of their apartments that, you know, were maybe trying to work from home or wondering what the heck's going on because it was so loud and it was so visual and like people who had roof racks were up dancing on top of their cars mm -hmm. and, and the police, you know, that have been so super militant and awful and expecting violence for so many years oh, yeah. just kind of stood back and watched and, you know, they were on bicycles. So it was, yeah, to right. me, that was cars now. I mean, I yeah, mean, it was way less intimidating in for myself. In these main protests, our, our goal is always to stop down the flow of traffic, right? We want to take an interstate. I, I've been in many protests where we're like, head for the interstate state but we could literally just shut an interstate down by the volume of people we bring yeah and it was good to just like pick your spot know your route and then we used a lot of the bicycle people as we moved through the city to to help you know because people get stopped at a light or you know not sure where they're going so we they had people spaced out along the path with the bicycles that were easily visible and there was a lot of great homemade signs there was a lot of press you know, it's a very visual aspect and, you know, having organized a ton of these events, I think it was super successful. I think you're going to see a lot more of them. And, you know, we see these people having parades for birthday parties or for, you know, seniors graduating that's happening right now. And so noise parade, I mean, I don't know. I grew up in a small town where we had noise parades when, you know, we won the regional basketball game, you know, and they'd bring out the fire department. Like, it's, it's been a thing and it's been a thing of solidarity. You know, the whole like come out at eight o'clock and bang your pots and pans that was started by labor. So okay. it's, it, it, and, and I, you know, I was kind of like hesitant because I didn't want that to be so co-opted of just like, yeah, we're going to, you know, make a joyful noise, but there, there is some, some levity to that and that it's a, it's a huge moment of solidarity. And I know everybody had fun. People were dancing. I know I was going live, so I couldn't, um, blast my music so loud but the rest of the time I had my awesome playlist rocking and and we we had a blast it was nice. fun it looked like excellent fun. so Ooh. I look I look forward to more all right anything else going on oh. another red strike still happening from what I hear yeah we've got I in fact I want to update I think we now know 37 million people filed unemployment this week wow and again, we know that's a wrong number, so it's probably pushing past 40 million. 
So if you look at what that means in a household, you know, this isn't the day when there's one single breadwinner and we can just, you know, oh, they pay the rent. I stay home with the kids. Like that is, that is not the thing. We're all working two and three jobs with a side hustle on top of it just to make ends meet. So having massive shutdowns like this and the stifling of creativity, I, again, my wish is that I hope we get to a place where there is more, you know, worker cooperative, um, employee-based systems where we're able to control the dialogue, the narrative, the benefits, have a say in what we want to do. And I think there's, I, I feel like there's a bit of a renaissance happening. I know, um, friends, friends and partners and I were talking about that today. It's like people have not had this much time to themselves in okay. so long. Like you're alone with your thoughts, you're alone with your kids, your pets, or, you know, your roommates, you know, it, it gives you time to really reflect on, on how you want to live your life and what's important and what matters to you and hopefully be creative and hopefully, you know, really push the mutual aid piece. I hope you're all gardening and, you know, really enjoying the space that you're in. And if you're not really asking yourselves how you can improve that baby for you right and here. your neighbor. I got some little babies that just popped up today. Yes, yeah, gardening and creativity. Yeah, that's really the creative juice has been flowing lately. You know, like, okay, let's get in. I don't have time to paint. I don't have time to do the things I used to do. Now I do. Yeah, so I, I hope there's a rebirth, you know, not only for, you know, a green labor-based economy and shortening of, of the supply chain, but I hope that we're having having some some reflective moments of, you know, how do, how do we care for ourselves and how do we want to make this world look going forward? Um, you know, also, hint reminder, you have a week and one day until Mother's Day out there. You all have a mother. <laughs> this is your reminder. You all know a mother. Yes. Uh, <laughs> having been part of many mom's groups. But also, um, you know, I know we have a lot of things planned. I, I know we're getting things out on uh, a lot of different platforms these days. I know Oz's Daily Dive shows hitting it up on uh, on iTunes and Spotify now. We're, we're, we're really cruising forward in, in a lot of different ways. And I'm just, I'm excited. You know, I'm, I, I can't, I'm a, I'm a, you know, glass half empty person, half full. I've got to, I've got to expect the worst and hope for the best and, and plan for the future. I'm excited. I'm seeing this movement uh, adapt uh, the way it, that it needs to. And just in the last three days, I have been online doing interviews with people across the country that have realized that hey, the progressive movement's got to get out there. We've got to move our independent media. And that means even if you don't like being in front of the camera, sometimes you just got to suck it up and, you know, get those stories out there, get the information out there, get our platform out there. You know, this is how we're fighting. And I, I, I don't know. It's not like we didn't know we needed to do that because we did and we have, but this lockdown has changed how we are doing that. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that we started dabbing our toes in this medium a couple of years ago um, and just been hit and miss on trying to figure it all out because we do feel much more comfortable with it right now uh, when others are just trying to figure it out. So I feel happy that <laughs> we went this direction. Um, we're still learning, of course, um, but we, you know, I know Oz has, you know, been really working, you know, with other organizations, with other groups, um, you know, really trying to form this federation of independent media, and it's very important. So if anybody at all is looking to get uh, involved in that or, or have done pieces to that, uh, reach out uh, to us. I mean, it's it's happening. Uh, also, with some radio things going on. Um, I mean, it's 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 we're really building up. So just reach out. Let's all get connected and start figuring out how we can get all these shows together in one spot and protected. And how would they do that, Rhonda? How are they going to find us? Well, one way would be just to email us, WashingtonBernieKratz at gmail.com, but you've got UphillMedia.org. And actually that one's, that one and probably the Bernie Kratz is probably the best to, to email. Otherwise you can go through and message through uh, the website, 
has us, you know, when you go to the website on Uphill Media, you can, you know, contact us and uh, reach out through there. Awesome. And, uh, is and there a particular one you would prefer for you directly? My Patreon account would be fine. <laughs> Yeah, oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, that you'll find that in most rundowns I do, unless I forget that. Roar me. Media. Roar, Roar Media. Media is is the Patreon that really does help support Oz's piece uh, with with all the things that he does. So not just Uphill Media, but with you know the coalition and with I mean it's just so many things. So yes, Patreon for Roar Media to help support Oz's uh, time. Oh. Would be investment amazing. equipment yeah. instead of calling it two buck chuck just call it two buck oz on <laughs> on on roar media for, on his patreon two bucks a month that helps keep the lights on for everybody that i'm working with and you're all wonderful thank you yes please you can find that in the rundown as well so yeah so you know that's what needs to happen a couple bucks here and there from people who are you know think what we're bringing to them is at least is enjoyable and or informative um hopefully both uh, <laughs> to keep us going uh, a little bit to roar media would be beautiful so thank you very much yes 99 cents for the one percent yes and oh. then don't forget <laughs> about uh, other things that we're doing, um, we are trying to put them out on YouTube and Uphill Media as far in advance as we're able to get them ready. Um, but otherwise, uh, in the rundowns, there are links to all the different things that we do. Uh, next Saturday for our town hall will be all about anti-corruption and election reform. Uh, we've got uh, a few wonderful guests coming to that, uh, one being Cindy Black. Um, and I just got a confirmation of another, so I didn't have time to put the name right in front of me, so I apologize, but it is from Ranked Choice uh, Voting, so uh, we'll be talking about that, um, Fair Vote. So it'll be somebody from Fair Vote uh, talking about that piece. Um, and then uh, Monday through Friday, we meet at 11 a.m. and just kind of a community uh, kind of um, update. We come together and, and just check in with each other. Um, every day kind of varies. Uh, Sunday nights, the first three normally in the month is our statewide meetings where we get updates from the, the groups on the ground um, and organizing pieces. Um, phone banks every Thursday. Those are very important. Join us on those. We do meet up right beforehand. We train and then we all call together and then we come back together and talk about how they went. It's actually a pretty fun time. I'd love to see you there. Um, so anyway, there's lots of things to join us uh, for. So please take a look um, and we'll see you in one of those. Um, I know that Sharon Abreu uh, put together another song for us for tonight's town hall. And I have not seen it yet and I cannot wait <laughs> to see how it came out. She is a beautiful human being. Oz, are you about ready to, to, to play that? <laughs> yep, we're good to go. All right, thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank and the name you Amanda and Masta for joining us as a special thank guest. You. We're going to see more of you is what our plan is. And Amber, thank you as always uh, for taking your time and, and making our shows as complete as possible. Yes. And I was just going to say one thing we didn't get to talk to Jeff about that we most definitely will when we bring him on in the future, that this song is called Just Transition, which is about making that just labor movement involved transition to a green new deal and a renewable future. So thank you again, everyone. Have a great night. Hi, we are Sharon and Mike, the Earthlings duo from Orcas Island. And we'd like to do a song for you from my one woman climate change musical show. It's called A Just Transition. Transition. 
Transition for the 21st 